Okay. I think we're good. Um, okay. Yes. Now we can see you correctly too. Great. Great. Huh? That one. The front screen is black. Yeah, Did the oh the camera went off? So I'm not seeing them anyway. Let's just get started. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this is the Center for Science and Technology Innovation. Uh, we're here with our partners, and today we're going to start. Uh, day one of three uh, two-hour sessions in which we are going to present to you ways in which as a scientific and design community uh, we believe uh, there are some ample pathways for achieving net zero and there's a lot of discussion about net zero um, what we want to do is begin to delve a little bit into the technical aspects of what it would take to achieve net zero without overburdening everybody uh, with uh, technical details. So uh, we'll switch back and forth. Um, we have uh, the first presenter will be Professor Shem Wandiga, who is managing trustee of CSDI and one of the first climate scientists across Africa. Uh, he will contextualize uh, the information not only for today, but also for the sessions to come. Uh, then he will be followed by Dr. Elena Roska as a Shezi University in Ghana. Uh, we'll learn a lot about the sensors that we need to collect these data. Um, uh, there, right now, a lot of people are using software to estimate emissions. Uh, that could be erroneous and dangerous, especially if the software model is not mo developed using parameters for our local climates. And so we want to be able to show how that can improve. And Dr. Elena will take us through some of that, their experiences in building these sensors locally. And then uh, we will then be followed, she will be followed by architect Cedric Sambank from Cameroon, who will start guiding us through how we can take our local materials and uh, work them as high performance construction materials so that we're not, um, held in this paradigm of always having to import. Uh, we have plenty of uh, quality for uh, good materials and also uh, um, sustainable design that is uh, indigenous in, in our, our, our different traditions. So uh, with that, uh, I will, I will um, ask my uh, Professor Shem Wendiga to switch seats with me because we're having a little bit of a difficulty with the group camera. Hold on one second. Good 
Good afternoon, everybody. Maybe morning, afternoon. evening, or uh, uh, good night. But uh, I want to talk about regenerative construction. Uh, Africa is the leading continent with mega projects, regenerative projects. For instance, the, pil the, the, the pyramids of Egypt have been with us for over 400 years, 4,000 years of mega project. And they are still with us. They have left a legend in our thinking. We have also the uh, stone walls. We have one in Kenya called the uh, Timlich Ohinga, and we have the Zimbabwe uh, uh, Great Walls. These are walls which were built without any cement. And certainly they have left a legend and they are still with us. And for that reason, I'm asking, is Africa going to have a, a legendary, legendary stone wall again? Stone wall or a pyramid or any other construction which will stay with us? Let me <clears throat> let me go ahead and look at the building of African uh, uh, construction uh, nature spheres. The nature spheres we have to build have been very difficult for us because we always lived with nature. And therefore, we did not conceptualize that we will have to build it. We thought we already we always had it. But now we have to look at uh, the way we are developing. We are increasing in having slum areas or uh, areas where we have problems like uh, uh, cities. The rules are being changed. And some of the examples which we can look at are uh, the earth, earth buildings that we, we, we can see. For instance, <clears throat> the pyramids were built by stones and there was no binding. Now, if you are to put, uh, take uh, granites and put them together, we have to find a binder. And finding a binder for granites is going to be difficult. But we have in the past the Timbuktu Jena, Jena village, which was built by earthworms. And we have that one is still a living example of earthworms that we can do. And we can easily continue to look for such earthworks which would survive our area and give us prosperity in our uh, 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 society. Uh, when, when you look at uh, building an African uh, construction uh, in, in our areas, we often, uh, uh, construction nature sphere, we often think of a heavy, having a heavily industrialized countries' uh, uh, patterns. We copy those patterns but we don't have the feasibility and the possibility of getting those patterns. Uh, emerging industries like ours have to create new patterns and have uh, the pleasure of reducing the emission of greenhouse gases in those patterns that we create. I'm particularly interested in seeing that the smoke 
which is emitted, the CO2 that is emitted by industrial countries become less and less so in the developing countries and particularly in Africa. And I say this because, first of all, our consumption of uh, oil and uh, other things is only about four or five percent and we should be emitting only about four percent of the greenhouse gases but we are not uh, doing so deliberately so that we can emit less greenhouse gases as we go along and this is going to create us a problem and uh, the reduction of greenhouse gases is one of the cornerstones of the climate change why greenhouse gases i want to bring to your attention that there are a few of them but the one which is used most often is the carbon dioxide which forms about 0.1 percent of or one percent of the atmosphere what is happening with carbon dioxide is that it becomes a heat sink it stays in the environment in the atmosphere and absorbs heat in the long range energy level way, but emits that same heat in the short wave, uh, the long wave, and emits it in the short wave. Now, I've stopped the short wave and emits in the long wave, beg your pardon. And uh, if you think that the long wave is useless, most of you have uh, uh, used uh, your uh, cooking uh, microwaves, and you see how fast the microwave cooks. And that's how the earth is being baked, because the heat goes up and is sent down again, and then sent up and sent down. And so we have an exchange, continuous exchange of heat going up to the atmosphere and being radiated back to the ground. Uh, we have the advantage here because we have the advantage that uh, we our financial demand is not as high as the financial demand of the industrial countries to fill. For instance, uh, the industrial countries require at least 150 million plus dollars to build uh, a complex or uh, a nature sphere. For us, we need about uh, something like uh, $20 million to build an, a nature sphere. And we need many 20 millions, not one block big 20, 150 million. And that gives us the advantage that in the developing countries, we can replicate and do a lot more and create more nature spheres with the, the money that we get. And for that, we need building projects. We need uh, pooling uh, information and uh, we need to see how we can work with one another to do those two. Lastly, let me say that uh, building an African uh, construction uh, nature science uh, will greatly help us industrialize much faster and will give us uh, a space which is livable, which is enjoyable, and uh, uh, we need to uh, see how we can begin to gather data that will enable us to do all of those so that we have more nature spheres in our environment. Lastly, we need models. 
we need models, not copy models from the developed countries. We need to develop our own nature uh, solutions based on uh, nature-based solutions and integration. And building these models require most of us uh, to change our mindset and to begin thinking the way our forefathers thought that they had forever a beautiful nature, nature living environment. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you. I'm in the background. I'm going to, so we're having trouble with the chat function. Um, Anybody have questions, you can raise your hand and then I can promote you to allow you to talk to ask Professor any questions. See, we have a lot about seven people in the chat. So if you have a question, uh, you can raise your hand. Excellent. I think you have all understood me. <laughs> so let, let us save time. Oh, here we go. There's Sebastian. Okay. Go ahead, Sebastian. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much Hello. for... For, for taking the time to explain us um, the, the way forward. Um, let's say uh, from, um, from from what, where you are where you are looking at, what do you see, let's say, as, I mean, you've been talking about financial challenges, but is there any other changes you have in mind that prevent you to accelerate towards achieving your, your goals on a short-term basis? I think financial challenges are always there, but we, when you have a good idea, you will find a financer, financier. So always look for good ideas, be innovative in your ideas and approach it. And you'll find people coming to uh, help you do the job. Alternatively, we can also persuade our governments with the good ideas to help us solve those good ideas. But I strongly believe that any good idea will be funded today. And, and just to add on that, Sebastian, this is Cecilia, um, data, uh, but uh, that is avoiding getting into that because uh, both Elena and Cedric will present a little more on uh, some of the data and then I'll, I'll loop that back in. So when we're saying 20 million versus 150 million, uh, in theory, uh, a building costs what it costs. And some would say if you're importing materials, it would cost more in um, the African context, but that's what we're challenging. Why, why are we importing so much of these materials? So data to be able to balance and make those arguments from a scientific basis is also a, a challenge. Thank you very much, both. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, fine. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> And now we'll switch to Elena, Are you ready? Yes, I am, can you hear me? Yes. Great. I just need to share screen. Let me with stop you. sharing on right. my end. Yeah. And I'm gonna... And for those in, in the audience, uh, you can also be uh, typing questions in your Q in the Q and A box. So I think you can see my screen now. Correct? Yes, yes, we Great. can. Great. 
Um, so thank you very much for this amazing opportunity um, to participate in this event. And um, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of just a peek on two projects. And one is more geared towards uh, materials and the other one is geared more towards sensors. And I'm hoping to leaving you with an idea of how perhaps we are looking into incorporating a little bit of both. So first of all, I wanted to start by acknowledging and thanking to uh, uh, giving my thanks to the university and particularly to the students who've been um, working with me on these um, two particular projects. And um, to introduce a little bit perhaps about uh, the Oshesi University, which is um, um, located in Ghana. And it's a small private university, one of the top universities currently in, in, in Ghana. And um, we have also, as a university, have made a, a big commitment of introducing um, students to the issues of climate change and um, uh, really trying to um, uh, really being intentional of convincing them to um, think and look at these uh, at, at these options and at these problems and come up with innovative solutions. So the first of the two projects is a project that actually builds or uses kind of a biosensor approach, but it's also the same approach can be used for creating new materials. And we have been um, really focused on the coastal environment. Um, the coastal environment is a big problem globally, but uh, or uh, coastal erosion, I, I should probably say correctly, has been a big problem globally, but also a, a very big problem in Ghana. We have seen communities entirely being swept to sea. And as you can see, it's been, you know, a, a large percentage of population lives within um, a proximity to the environment, to the coastal environment. Um, and um, of course, the climate change is creating big problems, which led to increased erosion, to changes into patterns of hurricanes and typhoons and strength of those um, natural elements, which creates very big um, problems for these communities. And so typically our solution um, has been uh, focused on creating some sort of defense against these forces of nature. And those defense, um, defense um, oops, sorry, um, those are uh, typically these really large concrete walls which project um, into the uh, the ocean or and try to protect and reduce um, the um, the erosion that's being caused co uh, caused by the ocean. Unfortunately, there are um, use two things that 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 we observe with them. One is that they are really not. Um, uh, they're they're creating problems for the ecosystem, and secondly, um, they are using loads of concrete to actually build these structures, and they're not really um, inducive of interactions with the natural ecosystem, and so it produces a lot of destruction. And so the group of students who decided to work on this problem undertook this project over the summer and. Um, their focus was um, to develop a natural or a biologically um, um, solution to this to this problem and create a um, a material that it will be a lot more um, friendly to the ecosystem. They presented their work um, at the Internationally Genetically Engineered Machine, um, which is a big international competition for these type of projects and from all over the world, students come in and present. So just a little bit, I'm not gonna bore you with all the detail, but just to give you a little bit of, of insight in their approach, um, they took uh, inspiration by from one of the one microorganism, the Sporosarcina pasteuri, which is an organism that is able to um, break down um, uh, urea into two co in, into components and by using of a urea, a urease um, enzyme. And then using calcium, it actually produces cal uh, calcium carbonate, which can then precipitate and, co uh, and uh, aggregate and form a, a brick material, a, uh, a similar to concrete material. Uh, the students also were interested in addressing another global problem and also um, very prevalent in Ghana uh, in um, the plastic pollution, the ocean plastic pollution in particular. So they looked at another um, 
microorganism which is capable of adhering to the plastic um, particles and actually enzymatically breaking them down into its components, the ethylene glycol and the tetraphthalate. And so they took these genes and they put them into different bacteria, a marine bacterium that is normally um, existing in the oceans, and they created um, a semi a, a small micro um, ecosystem in which these bacteria are either producing these uh, enzymes and are able to continue creating this material on um, continuously. Um, however, because it's a very it's enzymatic process, the pH can go out of um, out of balance. So they've created the organisms which are able to be turned on um, when the uh, the pH balance uh, the pH balance is lost, bringing back the the um, the normal pH that is needed for the production of these materials. So you might ask, you know, how does this compare with a, with a concrete that we normally use in construction and how do we make them? So to make them really, we, we mix the sand and the media and the cells, we allow the cells to grow. They lead to the, the formation of the calcium carbonate and its, its precipitation. And then the ethylene glycol, which is um, coming from the plastic, soars uh, sort of as a physical cross-linking of this formulation, giving rise to these bricks. Um, there's again a, a bit of an issue there that we need to optimize as to how much um, we need to, um, how much humidity do we need to allow in these bricks for the uh, maintenance of the organism, but also to be able to maintain the properties, the mechanical properties they're needed for these uh, materials. And so you might ask or wonder, you know, how does this compare to the current state of art to the abiotic controls? And this is data not from our labs, but from the, the research that we took in, uh, inspiration from, and that shows that the fracture of the um, uh, living building material is actually a similar, if not even a little bit higher, than, um, than the abiotic um, control that we can see that they were able to carry load and it takes even a higher load to induce a crack. And they're able to um, also um, have similar um, stress and strain uh, uh, properties. Now, the additional um, thing which um, the abiotic controls will are not able to do is that these materials are able to self-heal. So if these cracks occur and the micro cracks occurs, we have bacterium that are able to turn on when light um, becomes, um, uh, they're under a light promoter or, or switch. Um, because as a crack happens, you are getting a higher penetration of light. So those bacteria will be activated, starting to produce even more calcium carbonate. So therefore trying to bridge this, um, this crack. Um, so this is kind of in, in a material production and these bacteria, as we engineer them to produce a material, we can also use them to, we can engineer them to sense different uh, um, environmental factors such, um, such as um, metals, for instance, in, in the environment. Uh, we, we can use them all to also um, CO2 detectors. We can use them to create um, or clean environments as well. So there's loads of different applications for them. Now for the last um, next couple of minutes, I wanted to um, highlight a different um, um, project which looked at monitoring um, environments. And it was also in the context of climate change, looking at organic waste, which contributes to the um, to a lot to the greenhouse um, the greenhouse gases. And also to solve a problem of food waste, where we, we know about a third of the food production produced globally is being wasted. And so as a result of that, we looked at nature again, and we looked at particularly the black soldier flies, which are non-pathogenic and they don't they really don't transmit or transfer any disease, but they produce very larva that's extremely high in protein, which can then be used as a, as a feed um, for uh, poultry or for any other animals, particularly for fish as well. And actually it's been even introduced in hum for human consumption. But rearing of these um, uh, flies, it's um, a little bit time consuming and difficult. And again, it's very sensitive at the environmental conditions. So this group, these students have looked at de developing this particular um, 
um, housing that is capable to monitor not only the growth and the, the environmental conditions that are necessary for the flies, but also um, the environment, the conditions that are necessary for the food um, waste that's being introduced in terms of its aeration, in terms of uh, humidity, um, temperature, and it's, it's actually able to um, self-adjust to maintain um, uh, an equilibrium environment. And then collect all the data. So it's those are sensors that collect data and then send it remotely to clouds. And then we can do a lot of analysis on looking at to um, at how um, to maintain or how what to learn about the system and how to maintain it and how to optimize it even better using AI and machine learning to be able to um, to make these predictions. So lastly, I would like to leave you with a, with a little bit of an idea that we could combine some of these processes and we can create um, materials that are um, enabling um, nature and working with nature to purify or maintain a good environment that we can monitor environment in terms of, um, as we just heard, that's important to have data in terms of cooling information, in terms of heating information, what's the rate of cooling, um, how long does it, right, how long does it, it will take for a particular material to cool, and then to maintain an environment that is um, clean and healthy for the inhabitants of that. So we're looking at collecting these data, continuously monitoring them, putting them on a cloud, and then using AI and uh, machine le uh, learning uh, algorithms to try to make predictions and be able to adjust um, these environment. So I hope that with this, I gave you a little bit of an insight in some of the projects that we do, and I hope that you would be willing to come with us on this journey of building with nature for a much better humanity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elena, and, and thank you for a wonderful overview. Um, the, one of the main reasons we're bringing Elena and Cedrix in, uh, into the presentation, whenever we are at meetings, and um, uh, this happens to us particularly uh, with uh, private sector members who've had foreign experience, the first pushback we get is that all the advanced research is happening in Europe and, and the US and other places, and there's no such talent on the African continent. And uh, we wanted to show live and well for those who, uh, to show it's here. Uh, there's no need to go. And if, if companies are willing to go and spend uh, three million uh, U.S. dollars to get a prototype done in a foreign lab, uh, that three million could go a lot further by uh, investing in Elena and her team and other teams. Uh, you'll get the same exact quality. You'll get people who actually understand uh, what the local conditions are. Uh, they know the local microbes. They know the local performance data so that when you're bringing it back in, you don't have to spend again to get your product recertified and readapted and uh, adjusted to uh, the local conditions because it's already been done locally. Um, you have a question here from Cedrix of in between panelists. Can your process help monitor local architecture, ancient design or mo hybrid monitor? So uh, Elena, I think when you were mentioning um, the uh, high level sea rise. I know here we're having the same problem on our coast mm -hmm. and we are trying to estimate like for example Fort Jesus and there are a lot of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to monitor um, how to get those sites, uh, mo the rate of deterioration of the materials and so how, yeah. So I understand, I don't know, um, we haven't done anything like that. We can probably consider and looking, we just need to find what are the properties of um, deterioration that we're looking for, right? And what can we measure? So um, that can be, can be done either electronically or it can also be done um, um, biologically, for instance, if we're looking to monitor particular breakdown molecules, for instance, we might be able to engineer something that's biological that can, me that can measure those. 
and 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 dad will get into a little bit more of that tomorrow but um for example when he was mentioning carbon dioxide uh it's one of those gases that triggers oxidation uh mm -hmm. it, when it reacts with different materials could we potentially uh by having a sensor that detected the level of carbon dioxide on near a building be able to start estimating the level of the oxidation of the materials on the outs the exterior of the building. That's a very good, um, a very intriguing question. And I would want to say that I think so, that I think it's possible. Um, we haven't looked at it, but we can definitely um, consider that something that I'll put on my next uh, projects to think about. I think it's a great point, uh, uh, a really, really great point. And so we'll, we'll look into that. Thank you. Uh, any any questions from the audience before, so that we don't turn this into a, a, a inter-panel discussion? Any questions from the audience? You can type in the webinar chat or raise your hand uh, so that we can call on you. We're a little ahead of schedule, so try to give um, chances for... Let me ask a, a question to the audience. Uh, th thus far, what you've heard and you're all coming in from different perspectives, be it the community or uh, private sector. Um, do you see anything that you could use or uh, any information that you could carry forward from Elena's presentation to others? Yes, Cedric is saying happy because he needs more time for his presentation. <laughs> so there's two. There are two questions in the in the chat. Um, the, the one of the question for charity says, "Are there similar IoT solution for wastewater?" And the answer to that is yes. And we have been working on several different options for those. Um, so yes, I can I can give more answers to you know more examples of that. Not not at this moment, but yes, we have been working with with, with quite a bit on those. And then charity also, um, charity, a different charity, it looks like, um, had asked um, on the self-healing concrete on large scale production, is it sustainable in Africa given the pr procedures and infrastructure needed and what are the impacts of the bacteria? So um, I, again, I don't, you know, I'm not the best person to answer in terms of scalable and, you know, how, how would this be, um, you know, uh, uh, scaled up. We haven't discussed with a lot of people to think about that. There have been um, examples in other places, particularly I believe in the States that it has done, um, that have used similar approaches. So I'm tempted to say that yes, this is scalable. Um, the bacteria, uh, particularly I think in Africa, carries a lot of um, bad reputation <laughs> in a sense um because i think we we we've seen it being uh, creating lots of havoc in terms of, of health related issues but these bact particular bacteria are non pathogenic they are bacteria that exist in the environment and um the the example with the with the sea defense walls it is i'm not so sure that that the bioconcretes are going to be very easily translatable to buildings, but they're definitely a good approach for the environment, for the marine environment, because they actually need the water, the the ocean, through to be able to um, to survive. So putting those at that interface between the land and the water, they are continuously exposed to water, uh, maintaining them, uh, uh, giving them the viability that is needed. So I think for that application it would be good. For other applications, we don't know that for sure as how to maintain the um, the bacteria alive. There's also other approaches instead of using um, instead of using bacteria live bacteria, we can use um, bacteria that may create spores, and so those are not full functional bacteria that can be incorporated in the concrete, and then when the fractures occur, the humidity that comes with that fraction, 
um, revives the spores in, into, ba into growing bacteria, which can then use the same pro uh, process of producing calcium carbonate and re-healing uh, uh, or, or closing that particular um, crack. So that's another approach that perhaps we could transform that into the current materials that are not ex uh, in direct contact with water, for instance. And just to add on what Elena is saying, the applications I've seen in the US of self-healing concrete in buildings, water is the key thing. Um, what they do is they put these sensors and they develop bacteria that are get triggered not only when there's water, but when there's mold. So mm -hmm. the self-healing uh, uh, part of the, the bacteria goes to work when it's triggered by a certain level of uh, moisture and mold in, in the concrete structure. And when that disappears, the bacteria stops working. Mm -hmm. um, you have another question, I think, from Cedrix in terms of, do you build sensors? Um, so we have um, the, the for instance, the examples that I showed you, these bacteria, and we, we do build them and test them in the lab and working on producing them in the lab. The electronic sensors we also produce. So the project that you have seen that I showed you with the a Black Soldier Fly was entirely built by, by a team of students. They built their own sensors, they integrated them, they um, connected, they, they interconnected them so they are IoT enabled and were able to collect data. So yes, we built them, we built them from scratch. And that's an important part because uh, we did a, a, a small, we were doing water sensors and the frustration that we had was uh, even if we had the technicians, you had to import the parts. And until we have enough people producing, uh, it's tends to be cheaper to import parts. Now, what happens is like, for example, you have the COVID-19 and what happened to us during our pilot was so global supply chain stopped. And needless to say, if you are a, a lab and you're trying to ask for 30 sensors and there's a manufacturer asking for 3 million, your, your order does not get any priority <laughs> whatsoever. Okay. So that's an, another part that we're trying to push for is uh, trying to have some some faith in that the local manufacturing community and the local scientific community can produce at these volumes, but we need the demand to switch to asking for local production so that then we we, we can be able to justify. And um, when I think the question was asked to Elena in terms of scalability, um, all of this, you have to do local tests. No scientist can tell you yes until it's been built here, right? right. Um, you can say uh, we, we, we're we pretty sure or we're highly confident, but until right. it's been built here, we cannot say yes. <laughs> so that's another reason for uh, 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 asking. And yes, and I see, yes, great financial opportunity for those of you who are in the private sector and um arrange for trade intermediaries or uh, uh, assemble, uh, be become intermediaries and market makers, uh, creating markets for that link uh, to develop these local scalable demand. I think that would be an excellent financial opportunity. Agreed, agreed. Um, any, any other questions before we switch? Okay, Cedrix, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome. They're here. Uh, we, we have members here listening, and uh, the unfortunately, the, uh, the attendees are on mute, but they're hearing you, yes. Okay, great. Uh, I want to share my screen uh, if possible. Uh, take this. I hope you have the screen. My screen not open. 
Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, okay, it's not, it's, great. we can see the PowerPoint. It's not maximized yet. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll just go this way. Okay, uh, switching from French to English. <laughs> Let me try. <laughs> You can you can uh, slip in a, a few French words here and there, don't uh, worry. <laughs> obviously, there will be French words there. Uh, my team prepared the presentation as if I was the only one uh, to speak. I still have up to 40 slides, but I'll go fast to keep on the time. Um, from roots to roots. So like uh, Professor was saying at the beginning, uh, we need to redefine uh, our identity as Africans in the built environment. And it's, I think it's not just for Africans, it's for everybody to go back to the roots. So with the past like this, how does and why does our future looks like this? Is it only the materials? Is it the technologies? Is it the approaches? Is it finance, lack of, uh, of means, or in quotes, our inability to produce riches Knowing that uh, the focus of past building was about um, mimicking the nature and producing totally and completely reversible buildings, there's a wisdom that goes along the way. Uh, if, it, for instance, in each time you say insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So obviously we are changing the narrative. I call this the sound of climate change because uh, for years, for decades, we've been hearing things, but no more change is occurring. Instead, uh, flood is increasing, uh, civil wars creates a uh, loss of generations, uh, desertification, et cetera, et cetera. So we must shift from sounds to concrete actions. And uh, for me, what we call informal settlements are really what is should be called formal settlement because we have 70 percent of the population living there so the little nice looking buildings uh, all around uh, are the informal ones because there are odd numbers around the massive ones so how can we recreate a new pattern a new africa new buildings new market obviously by learning from uh, the so-called informal and going from this point back to the early days. Uh, some years ago, 2015, I think, I was hearing uh, Christian Benima from Mass saying that we need uh, 700 million more housing unit, units, 300,000 uh, 300, schools, etc., etc., for to cope with the 2.5 billion inhabitants that we are supposed to have by 2015. Uh, making my small maths, uh, it means we must build nine health center every day, 33 school every day for the whole of Africa, and 73,762 housing units per day to be sure that that population have a place and where to live decently. We are not talking of those who can afford to have seven, eight houses, and et cetera, et cetera. So the challenge ahead is great. It means that we just have to find a way to transform these challenges to opportunities and that opportunity in a, in a, in a market. So uh, every generation must, in a relative opacity, discover its mission, fulfill, or betray it. We hope to fulfill it. Um, I've been passionate a lot by space architecture. Uh, and what can I learn from uh, developed science or evolved science that has been prepared for mass and the more harsh environment that I can bring back to Earth? And knowing that when you are there, you are, learn you are, you are learning from, from scratch. Uh, local 3.0 is the concept that I will approach here. So we have a local pattern completely reversible, like I stated, um, integration, sustainability, all the aspects, be it culturally, material, and everything. Then you have the, um, the global pattern. 
the new material despite our ability to make them more efficient like cleaning concrete and etc uh we state the paradox here i learned when i was trying to understand a little bit on economics the given paradox that states that uh, the more efficient we are in using a finite resources like coal or oil the more resources we consume so we must try instead to be uh, focusing on circular efficiency and uh, now people are bringing out what they call Lord Francis Kerry calls it the hybrid pattern. And we too, like in the lonely house, echo house here, we've been using that hybrid approach. But now it's time to shift to the rooted pattern. Rooted means that we don't just stick to what uh, is considered as the environmental, the sustainability scheme, but we instead add on it culture and when you put together the definition of architecture, architecture, solidity, um, functionality, and aesthetic, you add on it, and then you come on this uh, rooted pattern, you add on sustainability, culture, and you mix the two together, you will come to uh, um, another <laughs> nature sphere, I don't know, but another era of development where you can then now try to develop um, be, another approach to the house and everything. So I'll focus on a project here is the Mokolo by 2000 and uh, by 2050. <laughs> but uh, we conceive it as if it was to be built in 2035. So it's quite possible to have it. And the idea is to scale all those goals in a city or in a small plot, but for this time it's a city. So that's why I was asking if they can produce sensors because we will have more details on various elements you are analyzing, the architecture, the climate, uh, hydrography, maybe, uh, uh, how do you say, phone and floor. Floor is the, the trees, phone, the animals and everything. So from Colo, we had to identify all those species, meaning the pluridisciplinary approach. What are the species that are there are various specificities in which type of environment are living? What do they produce as uh, ecos ecosystem services or products useful for human? And what is the man doing that is disturbing their environment? We did the same thing with climate, uh, and uh, we also analyzed the architecture, obviously, the way the cities are organized. And we we can see that uh, various organizations are just repeating uh, the Western world type of approaches with particularly Barcelona, uh, so-called plant cedar. So sometimes you even see that in hilly areas, where there are hills and everything and valleys, people just come and draw straight lines as if you just have to break down the mountain. And then to develop, we become more expensive because for a way to pass, you have to break down, um, break down uh, hills and become more expensive. So we saw that the city has three areas we do, and we check on the various equipment in various zones to see what is needed. And our idea is to be able to rebuild in a less in smaller land uh, the same capacity. So where are we taking exploration? Uh, I will talk less of fractal or mathematics today, but more of design. Uh, here is the local pattern. We don't call it vernacular because that word I hate that word, but uh, it's the local pattern. It's rooted. It's what was there was growing from their capacity to improve their technologies uh, day after day. But also there's a, a transmission link because when you want to, in operation and management of this type of architecture means that there's generational knowledge transfer because after each raining season, after one or two years, there's something that must be done on the building. And with that, the building was supposed to evolve progressively. So you have the various materials available. So we dig deep in analyzing uh, shapes, how the wind goes all around it. But that's why I'm very happy uh, for, uh, due to the 
prayer uh, expose because talking of sensor means that you have much more data to improve on the quality of the, the architecture and it's already a new market. Uh, call it scientific market, but it will give more benefit to the finance later. So now we go to the plant the, the plants level. And this we have been doing it in various architecture. I understand that fractals in mathematics are, have the same logic, but when it comes to culture, you must uh, analyze according to each and various architecture. It mm -hmm. means the market becomes plural. The opportunity becomes located and can be scaled and shift all around. And those, those cross expertise will create a, more competition, so more benefits are possible to be made depending on your capacity of, of innovation. So here's the analysis of the problem in the city. So yes, and then we use that uh, that floor plan, let's say it like that, of a small house, and we try to understand how do they live in that house and how can they live with the same. Uh, pattern in the city, is it possible? As you can see here, um, the three rounds represent the city now, and the fourth that is coming in is the extension of the city, but with much more capacity than the tree on a smaller plot and a smaller land, taking into account all the challenges. And here is where enters uh, only the harmonic designing approach, where you can privilege the whole over, you don't privilege the whole over the parts. And even though the whole may be more significant, the parts are more fundamental and independent than the whole. So correction, restoration, everything is possible faster. We know that the area of Mokolo, because it's a northern city in Cameroon, the advantage of working in Cameroon is uh, four different geographical areas in the same country. So. You can study various types of, you have the forest, you have savannas, you have desertic plains, you have hilly places with stone everywhere. So, but here uh, in Mokolo, there's too much uh, flood from time to time, the seasons where the whole city is covered with water. So we, you can design for a whole uh, neighborhood an elevated platform. And then on that elevated platform, uh, you, you have ways, slicking, uh, cycling, everything on top of it. As you can see here, the various elements. And that elevated platform, in a certain sense, uh, you can use it to integrate all the waste management patterns and everything. So you come with something like this. Uh, I cannot explain everything, it take much too much time how you come out with the size of the building, how it's dancing and balancing, and the material technology obviously is the same than the local one. The only thing that changes here can and should be the structure because you must grow vertically, but without changing the way of living. You must create a, a appropriate spaces for people to live in. I send links for videos. Uh, we can open it later, where you see how, uh, what they call the tree of life, taken back to the Egyptian uh, genetic strategies to see how you compose the areas and everything. I think we should just play the video at the end one asking question so I can explain one or two things there. Um, and then also this, this, the construct the mentality here we are all scientists maybe or designers, so we understand it, the difference between uh, natural materials and uh, concrete as it is being used now. And what are then the advantages? In conclusion, you will see that uh, you you shift from eight begin for eight percent of circulation uh, to to 10% circulation, but most of it being uh, walkable spaces. And you know, in Africa, it's not it's not easy to walk everywhere because cities are always like highways. It's just a small corridor left there for people to cross, even not to walk on the streets. You The green, green here is 1% in the old city, and you go to um, 
green to 37%. Uh, surface battery, meaning the space that is built, you shift from 30% uh, of the land to 2.70%. 2.73 percent yes so you can imagine you're shifting from you gaining in land so in the possibility to allow the, the the nature to grow to develop or to increase farm space let's say green farm space and etc cetera, etc cetera, because the same capacity is being put in just 2.70 percent and it's not just due to high rising is also the amazing possibility that the local pattern gives you when you can understand it. Um, and there was no water prior this. Now we have 1% of water area and those 1% will collect all the flood waters and transfer it to develop new fishing ways and approaches that are, now we we'll just have to analyze the water See if we can grow some plants inside that would ameliorate the environment and which type of fish we can put there. And the recycling pattern can just be going on and on. And we know that then we are in areas where there is no much water. So it's a great opportunity for at least seasonal uh, period to, 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 to have that water. So in terms of environment, uh, you create a better environment for people to live. In Ping, there is the only road that is allowed for cars because we have, you imagine that you have cities or neighborhood like this because it's not quite a whole city, uh, but it holds the same population. I don't have the figure here, but I can have it once you ask, you be asking questions. It's the only place that is allowed for road. And we know that later, depending on technology, you can change it from, due to the size. You can change it from roads to highways, highway for to to take ways. I don't know. So, and then once you have you have it, you can you one building you can build a digital twin at the same time, and start monitoring in uh, from artificial intelligence to make evolve the city because essentially we have raw right here. Uh, then you will then analyze and you have the ability to make your the your buildings evolve according to the new technologies available to your masteries of the various components of the, the materials. In a sense, it could be the bed on of a never changing or evolving green agenda that will never stop because there's no plateau. It's not like the Ponzi bill environment. And when we, we talk of Ponzi, you know the, the Ponzi scheme where at a certain point there's no more reward. And the whole financial house will collapse. Here, the investor can keep investing or gaining benefits. I will not say eternally, it will not live that long, but up to the level where maybe if we say that the earth is too sustainable, I need it to reduce, <laughs> to, to destroy a little bit. So, idea, concept, design, manufacturing, operation, post recycle, reuse, all this. In the process, when you you wrote your approach in the in the various milieu, obviously you can learn from each um, local area to help evolve another one and get another market. So you have here the new city, and uh, let's say the old one. The, what is the difference? The number of inhabitants and. Uh, also, they are, the fact that they are embracing new technology to manage their waste. And if you are smart enough to not be using plastic and stuff like that, we can have um, a more efficient circular economy and then become more efficient in reuse eternally. So the materials we use are just, I'm not talking of data when, uh, the, my predecessor have very brightly talked about it and experienced it, but there's data collection that is required. There's a data use. You be must put uh, sensors, make evolve the building. Yeah, I'm talking of the building without technology. If we autom autonomate, if we get it to become smart, 
and if you get the material to become uh, smart too, imagine a bio source material that is smart. The capacities are much more greater than a smart concrete, for instance, because you destroy nothing to have it. And we are trying. We are it's still in try, uh, trying process uh, to be sure that to make sure that we use only and completely reversible materials. For now, it's been difficult. What we, we do in the project that, one of the projects that is built is to protect the walls as we can with the technique that in French, they say bon boat, uh, bon chapeau, meaning covering completely from brain, for instance. But here, there are, there are, we have the ability to, to, to grow it, the openings, everything. So um, I don't know if Cecilia can put us the video if she has the link faster than me. Because uh, I think this was my last slide. Everybody smiles in the same language. Okay, hold on. Let me let me try and, and transfer those videos. And while while I'm getting the videos, Cedric, um, one of the so one of the things that really excites me about Mokolo uh, is this issue of so dealing it, with yeah. flood. Um, because we have the fact that like here in Kenya, along the communities along Lake Victoria, uh, with the coming of the El Nino rains, they're experiencing increasing flood that lake borders, of course, uh, multiple countries. Uh, but that problem is not just limited to um, Kenya. Uh, we've seen in Germany cities, uh, they're trying to create sponge concrete. In the Caribbean, uh, during the hurricane season, uh, the floods are increasing. Uh, the uh, southern coast of the US, the same. Uh, and the solution in the West has been to change the permeability of the surface. But even with those uh, uh, and China just went through, even we're still seeing communities getting um, submerged by floods, even with permeable increase in permeable su substance as, as surfaces. So what you're saying is, let's start putting cities on elevated platforms. If you could explain that a little bit while I get these videos. Okay. So uh, after anal anal analyzing, <laughs> Uh, those solutions uh, all around the world, as you said, nothing changes. You bring out solutions, but if you are still on the water level, water will increase and not stop increase. So there are two ways of going around it. Locally, uh, when you analyze a project like what Kunle Ademi do did uh, in Nigeria, the elevated schools on the water, you understand that all you create floating surfaces or you build on top of the water level and then you transform that water into an economic opportunity to sustain the elevated platform or to reuse that money to build elevated platform. For instance, we must reinvent fishing, stop fishing uh, in the seas in a certain ways. Uh, we must reinvent um, water use, water management. So. Flood gives them an opportunity. Yes, you must have more uh, penetration on the ground, but you cannot have much than what the ground can take, for instance. So you must create uh, areas to collect and stop a quantity of water to reinvent fishing. The money you have from fishing, you design it into elevated platform. And those elevated platforms are not just platforms. There are also what waste center treatment centers. Uh, so, in a sense, you just have to look at the, the materials available. And for instance, if you don't have local wood that can stand water and stuff like that, then the uh, auto repairing concrete comes in place because it will directly be in the water. So, it will be then the opportunity to use those type of concretes and justify their use because you have to elevate. You cannot live at that same level in those type of area. 
That is actually a, a change in philosophy. Most of the uh, industrialized philosophy is keep the water out. You are saying bring the water in. And once we bring, must that bring water the water in, in and transform it into economic opportunity, transform it into forest, humid forest, have uh, inland mangroves because of the water is present. Uh, mangroves are all, all always in around the borders of seas and things like that. So you can rebuild mangrove inside lands where around Lake Victoria, for instance, you build mangroves all around where there's drought, it creates a new ecosystem. And that ecosystem can help you contra contra effect what you are destroying elsewhere. You cannot fight water. There's no way you fight water. The walls with falls, everything. So you must adapt. If you have to live in elevated platform, if you can live where water will not reach, you transform that water in uh, economic or environmental opportunities. And then the videos are loading. It's I think I've got too many things going here. A another question we get is that, or a challenge we get is that uh, people say these ideas are theoretical, um, and they're they they're looking for things that have been done already, uh, sort of ready to go. Can you explain in terms of what your firm has done, the types of projects that um, are already, you've already implemented and that clients are paying for so that they know that there are people who do pay for this? Yes, uh, sadly, uh, up to now, there are individuals, not yet community. If for the Mokolo project, for example, uh, we have to discuss with about 37 local associations that want to see their city change. And it's together that we build that uh, that concept. But we only design what is buildable with the available technology. Um, for instance, uh, we have split, let's say, the offer or the way we approach it. There's eco-programmation, there's eco-conception, there's, well, just put echo in front of everything. <laughs> programmation, conception, <laughs> design, materials, and uh, operation. Meaning that at all skills, for instance, we've just, uh, we are finishing a house. The design is completely modern in what it looks, but all the materials are sourced on that site, for instance. The only thing that we, we brought out of the site was the concrete for the foundation. And it's a uh, 2,000 meter square, not 2,000, no, 1,000 meter square land. But the way we approach it, you you collect the air directly, you put the mechanic uh, equipment there and everything. So. Uh, oh, uh, I you're getting a question from dad in terms of, Bamboo, ha have any of your projects involved the use of bamboo? Yes, we in we are increasingly using bamboo. Uh, we replace it, for instance, what they call uh, alucobon. I don't know if the name is the same in English. Those aluminum plates that are used to cover high rise. Music. We, yes, we are changing it from that to, to bamboo. Uh, when we were looking at the, the the, the 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 PowerPoint. Uh, there's a point where I was showing is a building that we called um, how they call it again. It's near me. Sit down, call the bachelor. Yes, mask de l'émergence. Where we are trying to use bamboo in facades. Why waiting for a proper technology here? Because you must understand the local species, how they work and everything. But we are increasingly using bamboo. To, call, to replace those metal panels on, on, on the wooden floors in various projects. But we believe that with, with bamboo, we can achieve much more. And especially because, like you say, you touch the floor, it's an appropriate way, place to go and to grow bamboo, for instance. And we know that each five years, you can, came and, you can come and collect everything and uh, you grow back again. So you have the potential for investor. You can just invest in producing bamboo in a mangrove, knowing that each five years we have everything harvest, 
and five years later, and at the same time he's performing a uh, reconnection of because things like uh, snails, those little animals will grow there and will have a new ecosystem. So that's well, another certain... interesting point because you're saying instead of like right now people say, okay, you, you have your forest somewhere remote and then you have the city. What you're saying is we could have the city, the, the forest uh, in, in the, in the, below the city and then you actually reduce the transportation time of going and, and harvesting the materials you need. Yes, that's, yes, you can just grow it uh around or in the city there are wetlands in all african cities here in yaoundé for example there are hills and there are valleys the valleys are wet places now uh, much people uh, use it to build informal housing and to perform informal activities the city is now going to destroy everything but if it is not replaced by another economic opportunity that help those people have new jobs and at the same time, uh, sustain uh, the space. They won't be able to keep it for long before people go back to construct there. So you can grow bamboo. I saw a question first, but uh, I do not have. Uh, yeah, okay. about do you have do local you have local actors? money yeah. of processing bamboo? Uh, up to now, we don't have. Um, I don't say manufacturer. They're just technicians. So we have to use our initiative to, to create platforms where the guy will perform their know-how on specific duty, for specific duty. But they have the ability to treat the bamboo appropriately, to grow it and to have various products because it's not only for construction. They produce uh, furniture, they produce um, what they call uh, charcoal, because once bamboo is burned, it, it, it seems it is a great, uh, great for urban agriculture because it helps increase production in small areas, small surfaces. So it just needs investment. But as an initiative, we cannot be preparing all documents for everybody at all sectors. But once we need it in a in a project, we have. Uh, technician and engineers that are able to use it. And it is not expensive. It's one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest material here. It's just that it's not being used into its full potential. And I it's like really, what it's the cheapest, about, it's the cheapest um, one. Uh, about it's the only one even the state allowed to exploit without uh, authorization because it will grow back again. You're talking about technicians, which brings a lot. Another issue is, is the local labor. We also get a lot of challenges that the mm -hmm. engineering and design capacity of, you know, we have more quote unquote unskilled than we have highly skilled. But what you're bringing up is if you design these projects right, uh, mm -hmm. You design them with materials that the communities already know how to work with. You're not introducing materials that they're that are foreign to them, and you design them in a way that you're taking advantage of the skills they already have. You can then get a lot of expertise that's been locked out of the production cycle because you're working with, like you're saying, what's rooted in the culture already. Yes. Uh, yes, that is absolutely right. Because they know how to use bamboo. The difference is that they will use it in maybe only one way. So it's up to you to say, okay, uh, when you do your design, you could use the, the detailed drawings appropriately and taking in account the way they assemble it, the way they, they generally manage it, or taking uh, technology out of the, maybe out of the bamboo, uh, all of the way they are using Bible, but in the way they are using wood. For instance, say the same thing you are doing with wood is possible to do it with bamboo. The only difference that for this size of wood, you must instead take this amount of bamboos because of the holes inside. The only thing that changes will be the, 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 the section and things like that. And once they have done one or two, the next time they are the one introducing to you uh, new ways 
on new strategies because they are technicians, they are hard, uh, hard workers, they are engineers. So at the end of the day, you create a, a possibility. One of the guys with whom we worked have now created a massive initiative. He, he took like, I think it's 10 hectares of land. It's, it's small due to the need, but for somebody who, who just built one house to go to take 10 hectares of land to grow bamboo, treat them and then start selling when he he will collect the bamboo all the ways they have a technique to to burn it down to produce um elements for agriculture the ones that are remaining for construction are being used in construction and and here for instance all projects private essentially that we don't use uh, is that they use to 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 to, to when they are pouring the concrete on slabs is this bamboo that is being used to, to maintain the flat, uh, I don't know, it's English that is disturbing, <laughs> to maintain it balanced. Let's say it like that. So bamboo is also, really being used. You, you had a slide where you had um, a mud versus concrete in terms of local materials. And I just wanted to mm -hmm. point out that um, in the U.S. right now, there is a boom uh, towards those who are looking, they call it earth architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, Ghana's rammed earth technique is being mass produced yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in the U.S., but not here. Uh, so how do you deal with um, those who challenge and say, uh, mud is a substandard building material, yet it's being used abroad in high performance buildings where, where but we're rejecting it locally. How would you how would you um address those challenges? Like Professor Wandiga said in the beginning, uh those techniques have proven their work already for centuries. So it's just people grew up watching uh, Beverly Hills with nice white house. So once they want to build they have that in their mind, so it's not easy to discon. It's not easy to deconstruct what they have in their mind because it's the subconscious that is speaking feelings and everything. So to challenge the feelings, you must bring facts. First of all, by we have done uh, uh, a, an adobe modern house here. Now everybody sees it; they are completely seduced. So it's just the process of proving that. It's possible, uh, like you say, Ghanaian uh, ram earth has been widely used abroad, and in the, uh, the climate environment. Also, there's the finance aspect. When you have to work with somebody, if you prove to him that okay, it will be cheaper in construction, cheaper in operation and maintenance, and the outlook, depending on his openness to new design or to casual shapes. The guy will just agree because when you, for instance, all of our projects, the challenge is to to save one third of the budget, and and that is possible almost each time. The, and despite the fact that the economy is not yet uh, turned to green, it means that once we turn to green, and then you have the possibilities everywhere, the equipment everywhere, and uh, everybody involved in the Jevon paradox will come in place because the more efficient you are in doing something, the more efficient people are in consuming it. And that efficiency now is just a repetition. He already have his price pre-scale now. So if, if somebody wants to disturb you, who tell that there's uh, there are Ed Bro schools in Gando there, he won a pre-scale. So it's the more the less actual things now. The only challenge and is to root everything, to have it completely circular. For instance, you have to collect the water to recreate fishing points. To collect water, you must have holes. And once you have holes, you have earth. And when you have earth, you have building material available. So meaning you wanted to recreate fishing, to produce, to uh, because our seas are being destroyed, there are a lot of plastic inside. The time to clean it will take a certain time. They can grow, uh, you say, algs. I don't know the name in English. There's algae. Huh? Algae. 
algae. Okay, it's the same thing. We can grow it to, to, to clean the water naturally while waiting for maybe advanced technology. You can collect the water in those holes. You take back the earth, the earth you use in construction. So you have a circular uh, economy. And then you dip, dip. Now, what am I doing with the earth? Well, the, 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 the natural earth is what I'll use to, not natural, organic, is what I'll use for my plants and everything in the city. The, the mineral is what I'll use for my, depending on the, the type of earth it is. It is clay to have your bricks. It's laterite, like almost everywhere in Africa. You have various uh, techniques. You have comb technique. And comb is a very nice technique for high rise because it's light. Then you had um, Adobe, you have com uh, complex earth blocks, etc., etc. So that earth can be even given to you freely if the, you, there's a connection of project because the one challenging the, the the, the fishing industry needs a hole. To have a hole, the, he must remove the earth. So once he has removed, what will he do with the earth? He will not put it aside. So it depends on how we approach it. And I'm just talking of big, uh, big projects because, like I say, when we have a land, even in the middle of a city, we use only the earth from that land meaning that there's no transport. The only thing that you rent or you have to buy is the, the equipment to produce maybe compressed blocks or the coffin when it's a uh, ram earth. Because uh, people like Dr. Elena, they have labs. You give them the earth, they will tell you the composition. And once you know the composition, and that is the cheapest thing to do to analyze it in a lab, to know the, the, the composition. Here is um, 75,000 CFA. If you convert, if you divide it, if you divide it by six, uh, uh, 600, it's something ridiculous in euros. So it's the price of a bread. You, you, you just have to, to analyze. Once you have analyzed, you know which, much, which technology you, you use. You can decide to go rooted or to go, um, Smart, but whatever the case, and you and how, how do that have we all have the earth? I analyze the size. If I want to do dig foundation, I will maybe change the the position, the size, the techniques to have more earth if I need it, and that give the opportunity to grow a bigger building and to have underground spaces that are very much needed to grow things like mushrooms uh, and everything. So. You create potentials. For instance, I'm trying to connect local associations that grow mushrooms and escargots yeah. and snails. Yes. We offer them underground space that users of the buildings we are designing don't want to use or are not yet ready to use, maybe for parking space and everything. They will come and grow those snails there. You have the amount of earth you want, you build, and at the end of the day, you have your one third of reduction. And then the business can start all over again. So there are a lot of important points that you're bringing up. Number one on this issue of emissions, which is what everybody's trying to do with this climate finance. You're designing a building. So this nature sphere, you're designing the construction process to eliminate as much as possible, any transportation to and from the site of materials, you'll have a little mm -hmm. bit of transport with the yeah, sure. um, with the equipment. So all this mm -hmm. energy in terms of uh, extraction, you're, you're now putting that on the site. Number two, you're developing capa absorptive capacity on the site because you're using the natural materials so that as the materials get extracted, any ma ma material that is not going to the construction, the, the structure itself gets absorbed into mm -hmm. local economic activity. So it's immediately put to use as alternative, be it farming, be it 
uh, crafts, be it um, uh, creating uh, different types of uh, on-site farming. Uh, the third part is that you're not designing single use structures. And by that, I mean, you design the office building and the only thing it can do is house maybe your um, computer people and your uh, professional people and their parking spot. What you are saying is that building, whether you use it for office, whether you use it for residential, there are a myriad of activities beyond parking and beyond the actual formal office activities that can be going on simultaneously because of designing this with community, correct? Yes, uh, correct. And I can complete by saying uh, uh, generating uh, single use or segregated uh, building is a method of the past. You have to stop it the fastest possible. So once again, it's the Ponzi build environment. If you are, you have to develop a building that only holds uh, one type of activities, you will not generate uh, maximum income and possibility, and then you have to be destroying nature from time to time again and again. So you must multiply the activities. The water you reuse in a, is an opportunity. The um, agricult urban agriculture is an opportunity. There are some projects where you have just have to change maybe the, the septic tank to a biodigester in a house and then uh, make associations with somebody that is doing um, a levage I have my personal translator here. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, but uh, people that are taking care of animals, let's say it like that, you bring the waste, increase in his waste, and you produce biogas. If you don't want the gas, somebody, another association can take it, and you have the compost and everything. So you must make all the projects circular. And the only way to convince maybe a somebody in his private house, unless he just wants privacy, is to show him that all those, those advantages are entering in his uh, maintenance and operation, or even generating him income. Once he, he is satisfied, then there's no more problem with that. The only thing is that you manage it, meaning that if somebody finance such type of project, to the project is not just limiting in once you have produced the hospital, the house or whatever, or the market. The project continues all along, all time, because there are many activities ongoing there for the maintenance and for to generate other income than always beyond rent, uh, rent, uh, how do I say, renting or um, selling the property, selling the various space and everything. So it's something goes to that. So if somebody comes here for instance and you start a let's say a small industry for brick production, he will just have to bring the, the equipment, nothing else. The earth will be sourced on various sites and everything like that. So he will be able to connect with various individuals. Another one also want to do urban agriculture. All the surroundings are available and open for that agriculture. Retrofitting the roofs or building houses with roofs that are appropriate, the underground, the underneath, the beneath. Even when you come to planish a land to have uh, this, the, the floor that is, uh, is proper for the construction, all that organic earth will go somewhere. The idea is, like you say, to redesign the process of building. And if you go back to, to, to rooted designs or architectures or buildings, you see that the community live in the middle of his economy. They don't go out of the, the place for to take something, else, unless they are in the area where there's no water and they need fish, unless that, but you can create small fish points because you need it where it's drought, you can create, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's limitless. I'm just limited maybe because I'm an architect. At the end of the day, you have um, it's all around design. 
So let's show people what you're talking about. And then, uh, so there's gonna be two videos. And then after that, hopefully start put typing your questions in the chat and raising hands. Feed yourself in. Is it showing? Yes, we put flying cars across the future of the city and believe we will be the future of transportation so we can learn from one place to the other depending on the type of fuel we have them to create a microclimate uh, under various buildings uh, the network is disturbing from my end but I hope you are watching it really well. Save by design. Doing the things we do. Spreading the news we spread. Yes, like we say, we we'll save the world by design. Yeah, those uh, construction elements are to accelerate the rapid transformation, avoid the uh, water from the ground to evaporate completely. Understanding the connection between the various elements of architecture, drawing a fractal. Feeling it up. So yeah, if I, if I had my first uh, command to do so, in my life, I'd like to take some more of it. Obviously, the platform must have holes. Uh, mimicking the forest, the forest are various layers, there are always uh, open spaces where the sun can reach from up to down. So the building in such a way that all the surfaces are able to have light all around. Tropical area is not that complicated, but it's still good. So I noticed you also used um, uh, cylindrical shapes instead of square or rectangular. Uh, I'm assuming yes, that's we are, the wind. Yes, it's the river. The wind there is very uh, going fast. So once you analyze how the wind flows, and then you have to use that wind to to cool the buildings and everything. So the, there are some openings that are weight. Yes, we can redesign it to be more squared but we just left it as the simulation brought them out so that air can be renewed all in the buildings and the diving can flow with no with no problem 
And you were mentioning, if you could highlight also, you were talking about, uh, even though it's a, a forest, so it's a dense uh, uh, assembly of buildings, but you you still have light going into everybody. We have We have a neighborhood here called Pipeline, where it's famous for... The buildings are very close together and there's there's no light even reaching the ground. What you're saying is you can have high density and still have a, a community that's full of light, correct? Yes. Uh, obviously, uh, we are in the part of Cameroon is the tropical forest, the Congo Basin. And when you analyze how some species grow and the amount of light they need, you understand that the forest needs to regenerate to destroy itself from in certain areas to create where the, the clear rear open where the sun can go directly. So you must analyze your density properly to make sure that uh, nobody feels nobody lives on shades <laughs> during the whole the whole year. So it's a must because light is life. And also, it will help the soil and the ground regenerate, and some species that are like ants and everything can grow inside out. And then, for humans, you must then now know which the quantity of light we need as humans, because and then use it to to to, to create those holes where it's to be placed. So now I'm going to. Do the second one. <laughs> In this video, we are just showing how we can use it. Not conceptual. Here we are normally in the area where the wind Due to the environmental situation, the density of the building, we are replacing the forest like environment in terms of uh, the way you manage the ecosystem. Able to bring the to everywhere. There are projects like really the How many people could live in this city this time? I'll check it and tell you the exact number. Okay. Thousand. Wow. In the, in the neighborhood, yes. Sorry, it's yep, there. We go. And you see, even the inside, it's not the same person, but even the inside, the way people are supplying the windows, it's not like usually. You are taking in account the way they are living now. Um, just modernizing. I see you have your The holes are to bring light down and up. The only thing that we could not put in those platforms was football field. 
those will be dragged in the ground for because they were fully Thankfully, the people in the group of people are not doing a documentary on the project. So, you have, you have, you have the, the, the observation of the people of the requirements of the community and then the observation of the project. Not just Mokolo, all the projects that we do, those concepts, what are those objects? We are putting color on the floor because there are new technologies, uh, electric technologies that can help yourself to produce electricity. So, for the for the how the floor light, for instance, can be looked to. So it, it 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 opens the mind, like you're saying, to the different types of possibilities of what a city of a hundred thousand people or a neighborhood. You were saying a neighborhood yes, of a neighborhood. We call it a city, but it's a neighborhood. Yeah. So after seeing that, uh, I'm hoping there are questions. Uh, questions, uh, raise hands. Yes, I see uh, Elena yes. asking, uh, this is Alson, so in your opinion, what is the biggest challenge in achieving this vision? I think it's uh, being able to present it to the finance world the right way. It's the only challenge because nothing is impossible there as from now to build, in fact. So that would be the biggest challenge to, to break it down as I'm doing like this but I'm not that good in breaking things down financially. To break it down to prove that, okay, from step one, you this can give you money, this one gives you money, this how you invest in this, this how. Uh, then in, interconnect the whole to allow policies to grow from it. So we to open, to have markets open to that. Because in, in each various domain, you can create income in a programmation, city reprogrammation, uh, meaning regulation, building codes and everything. You can use a project like this to recreate building codes to uh, shift the markets to work toward working that way without you even being the main architect to shift yeah. to shift the market. Saying that okay, each time you use that, you must create an opportunity for this, and then you you start surveying the the city to see where to do this and that. Each time you have a wetland, uh, use it for maybe bamboo growing or recreating a mangrove that will absorb a certain quantity of water. Or to, So just in programmation, you can have in eco-construction at each scale. That's why we call it. We, don't, we have not created the name Olonic, obviously, but that's the closest philosophical uh, thinking that we saw that we can give why waiting to create not biomimetism but cultural mimetism like we try to do? So uh, at the level of materials, you can decide. Okay, what are what is the potential of a location? What are the various materials? Here, for instance, the policy is stating that for public buildings, uh, that is a bit less than uh, three floors, you must 
you must, it's a must even build with earth. But up to now, people are still yet building with concrete and poor concrete, as a matter of fact, not even the high quality concrete. Mm -hmm. So you can shift the policy towards creating such an ecosystem. Then for those who want direct revenues, you choose a specific in, you can produce the materials. Uh, you will be cheaper, obviously, so you sell more. You can produce uh, housing, hospitals, and things like that. As there's, the market is why you saw the statistic, we, we need more than 73,000 units of housing in Africa per day. As from next year, each day, to be sure that in, by 2050, everybody is living in a house. So there's a uh, how will you achieve it? You cannot be shipping materials to do that. That's not possible. It will take time. We will waste the carbon in the process again. So maybe your house will be uh, bioclimatic or whatever, but the economy will not be sustainable. If you want to have a sustainable economy, uh, you just have to approach it in the root, rooted approach. And then to, to create space people are used to, you must take it from their the, 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 the informal or traditional way of living. Because if you go to the modern, you've lost 70% of your market. And In you have a of, question from, from Sebastian. Uh, we're, we're getting, uh, we're at the end, so I want to make sure Sebastian uh, has his chance. Yeah. Yes, Sebastian. hello. Hi, yes. yes. I just, so, um, First of all, really great presentation, amazing work. Thank you so much, sir, for, for presenting this. And uh, I really love the, the local source and the local materials. And I'm just wondering, you know, uh, are there also considerations starting out with a hybrid approach of kind of using, you know, carbon capturing methods to, to use, you know, waste and plastic to put them into the building materials uh, kind of in a short-term basis, you know, uh, mm -hmm. obviously long-term would be to use local source materials in the mud, but then also would it, would it save, uh, would it help the environment to, you know, capture the plastic and put them, like, for example, some places they make plastic bricks, sometimes they, they capture carbon into cement. So would there be an opportunity for like a hybrid approach to that in the, at least the short-term uh, to, to use that, uh, especially if you need to scale and make and make housing faster or would that be completely uh kind of going against it uh we cannot fight against people trying to reuse plastic uh, i'm just afraid that being more efficient in reusing would encourage more production of plastics but we can use it in uh, the manufacturer sector to construct basic shelters for industries because if you bring it in housing where you have the the biggest needs in terms of materials, we will just create a, a desire to go towards it. And we don't, I cannot completely know the effect on health on those plastics in the long run because uh, house is a living organism. We, are, we have new illness linked to, the, to concrete and to some materials like people are more fragile, their, their breeding systems and things like that. It's much, it's less performant than those living in complete earth buildings because there's a, a exchange in terms of in terms of elements of nature and things like that. So how can I advise to go towards uh, the manufacturing industries uh, or to how do they call it? maybe water collection systems? So not to use them in the building because we have already the local material that are better for our health. Those plastic can be used there knowing that the, 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 the need is not that much, but it's much enough to remove the plastic from our environment. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And you have a question from Charity Wairimu in the chat. What do you see as the trade-offs in adapting fractal architecture and planning? compared to the more you conventional Euclid or what we're using now, which is the Euclidean approach? Uh, as you saw there, uh, um, I've shifted from a 73% use of land to 2.70%. So 
So we have the same amount of population due to the fractal use. It means that I have more free land for nature or for other activities. Uh, you have seen that I have I've taken uh, three times less the surface area to achieve that, meaning that that neighborhood is three times less in terms of size than what is actually there. But it holds the same amount of population and even more because we can grow it more or higher. I just stopped here because I wanted it to be buildable. You say want to build it tomorrow. Let's assume uh, Elon Musk says that he can finance everything. Can build it tomorrow, yes. But if you go to steel technologies and and uh, printed technology, printing equipment and everything, you can go even higher. The only challenge will be to be sure that my forest approach of bringing light everywhere is taken in account. So that's the advantage of fractals, and and that is at all scales, even in the, the furniture scale. So uh, repeating that statistic, you can use one third less of uh, land to accommodate a hundred thousand people, and that's have... one third to accommodate any population. If you are, if the the local approach is takes ten thousand people in a surface area, we we'll just divide that surface area by three and and you have the same population in that surface area. And without them living in like in a modern city nowadays where there's no real sense of neighborhood, they're just high rise, high rise, high rise, high rise, and then the highways connecting them. So for a developer that is highly efficient because now, yes, uh, yes. especially in urban area, you, you have the high cost of land. So you're, mm -hmm. you're reducing uh, that cost of land acquisition by 33%. Do you have, in terms of square meters or acres, uh, that concept design, how 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 big of a space is needed? The one that Oof, we saw. Uh, I don't, it's, it's, I can just measure it and I'll send it to you, to you later because I don't yeah. have access now to my computer. I'll have checked all those figures. Too many projects, too many figures. Yeah, no <laughs> problem. <laughs> it had me help. No, but... but it's obviously, I just wrote one third. I just came with the. Okay. But even at the, the small housing uh, scale, it's the same thing. So that project that we did uh, on 1,000 meter square, we just used 200 to have the maximum amount of people that can live in the, 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 the space. So it's the same thing we are doing. And sometimes it can be even lesser than one third if the population is not, is not that so much, not that much. So then a, a, a takeaway from this first session is to think about uh, people, people believe what they can touch and feel. Here in Kenya, they call yeah. it the knock test. Uh, so what we need to then do, you have a site in Cameroon. Uh, mm -hmm. So we would need to see if we could find a site in Ghana and Kenya. And we could try uh, to, to do this simultaneously or in sequence. And that would address the scalability, the transferability, all these questions that we're getting. That would be a pilot want to have three of these Mokolos to come up. Yes, that would be great. That would be great. Okay. That would be great. Having aside from all these countries and uh, Central Africa, Western Africa, uh, in a sense, East or South Africa, yes, it will represent at least a, a much more wide efficiency. Young. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, we're, we're at the if, time. If possible, we... with developers that are involved with the level yeah, of guarantee. We'll, we'll, we'll have to get a developer who, who understands the concept, who won't uh, uh, try and, and shift the, the, the concept towards something that is faster to develop, quote unquote. <laughs> We want we will we'll need a developer who wants who wants to see this vision to fruition. Uh, it, it only depends on when he wants to, when he wants it to be built. If it is 
with the actual technology, we can the various level of innovation. So it all depends on the the, the timeline, in fact. Well, then we could potentially try. So if so, if you're saying so with existing technology, uh, we could start immediately. And then let's say if we wanted to go all the way to the push all the advanced technology, how 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 does that change the timeline? Is the planning timeline that we change? Because like I say, if you take more follow, uh, they can build it now. Like I said, there's nothing challenging. It's just to the time to prove that each element is uh, financially viable, yes, and brings a revenues it is the only time you will take. But there's a time to analyze the local architecture, the local everything, or the local potential. So in a sense, you have to work maybe with Elena to, to send so much faster because this takes too much time because you have to read, to go back, to to ask questions. Meanwhile, if you just found a living artifact, you put sensors there, in about one week, you can have various elements. So using existing technology, we're talking of a timeline from uh, in concept to uh, finalized uh, turning over to, for use. Is it one year or 12 months, 24 months? How long? Less than two years. Because uh, for what we have built, we have understood that we take much time in planning that in than in building. Okay. Because you must understand the the local economy. Okay, what are they able to build, and how can I go towards that way? What types of shape are they using to put in in a, to assemble? Okay, I'll go that way. So now, how can I adapt my fractal to those shapes they are able to perform? those materials they, they know how to use or how can I use the local material but in the techniques they are used to. It's only that will take time. Once you have done that, uh, you can even allow them on, on site, they will be able to understand everything because it's what they are used to. That's when you go to the short term approach. Now that's actually for 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 a hundred thousand people, twenty four months is pretty much within the normal construction timeline. So we're not we're not sacrificing uh, yes. time delivery no, no, time. No, now right. it's uh, up to you to manage everything. CSCI, that's your job. I'm just yes, asking. that's our job. <laughs> Definitely, that's our job. <laughs> I can just be explaining you how I come up with solutions because facing the problem or the questions that have been asked. See, having communities like this, where you have much more questions, maybe you have the ability to save them by design. Yes. But because design is not just another scientific approach in thinking. So. Yes, we're, we're creating a community and what we'll definitely do is with this video, there'll be urban planners, there'll be public works officials, uh, there'll be county uh, zoning of, of officials. So we will circulate this video and uh, try to elicit more questions uh, to your point to get more data into the design process. Uh -huh. And it would be great if you bring the data from the project you are, you are talking about, those three areas. It can be even smaller projects than that neighborhood will build. Uh, because once you do, once we are able to, to achieve them, no more questions will be asked. The next yes. question will be placed. Are you going with, along with us? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yes. So... That's all. That's why I ask if they are developers, because if not, we, we might not end up building. That's the thing. We'll we'll find we'll 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 find somebody. Don't worry. We'll find somebody. And with that, uh, I'll let uh, Dad give the closing remarks for today, and yeah. be sure to turn tune in with to us tomorrow same time same uh you have the links we'll re redistribute the links and now i'll let uh that uh, professor wandiga can't <laughs> 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 remember
Ben profesyonel bir. <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, for the wonderful time. I think we have learned from one another. We have exchanged ideas. And let's continue thinking about them and seeing how we can apply them. Have a good evening or a good morning or a good afternoon. Thank you. All right. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. This is a really, really interesting discussions and, and very thought provoking. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.